We are in Luke chapter 21, and today I'm looking at the, the end of Jesus' life as he draws near. He's about to end his teaching time in the temple. And, you know, the Gospel of Luke, for me, has been just enlightening, encouraging. It's been a, a great study and a great book, and it teaches us so much about just life in general. And one of the aspects that, that takes place in all this is we learn how important his word is, at least to me. We really learn what his word is about and why we need to live it. And each week I've been giving you a memory verse, something to stand on, something to build a foundation on. And today's message goes right along with, with really understanding his word and standing on his promises. Uh, the title of the message today is Wake Up and Walk Right. You know, and I think that's a, a calling for all of us that we need to wake up because we need to seize the opportunities. You know, life is short for every one of us. And the days for all of us are numbered. Nobody knows how long we'll live or how long we'll be here or where we'll be. You know, you could be here one day and somewhere else the next, and God is constantly at work in our lives. And the most important aspect of all that is that we allow him to work in us. It's not about us. It's not about who we are. It's about what he is doing in us and through us wherever we are, wherever we go. So the memory verse I gave you last week was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. And if you know it, let's say it together. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, roars around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Uh, let's read it together out loud if you didn't memorize it. Casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Doesn't really matter who. He's just seeking someone to devour. Don't be that one. Don't be the one that strays away from the flock and that is out there all by yourself thinking you can handle it. Because in this world, we're taught to be independent, self-sufficient. We're taught to be lone rangers. And the reality is in this, this life is there are no such thing as lone rangers as Christians. You know, as Christians, we need to know what time it is. And that's exactly what Jesus is teaching. He's talking about the times. We are in a war. We're in a battle every day. And souls hang in the balance, you know, and God has called us to the mission field. We are called to be a light in a dark place. We're called to take up arms. And if you were in a real war, you'd be paying attention. You'd be watching what's going on. You'd be looking around. You sure wouldn't be napping. You wouldn't be taking a rest while bullets are flying over your head. But for many of us as believers, we get complacent. We just kind of get settled in. We're enjoying our life, and we've got a good ride. And this is all nice and easy. And we forget that we're in the midst of a war. There's a spiritual battle that takes place in our lives every day. And for all those around us. And Jesus, you know, he's teaching about the end times here before he goes to the cross. Because it's important to him that people know what time it is. So we're going to pick it up here in verse 29 where Jesus, after just telling them about what was going to take place, he now launches into a parable. He says in verse 29, and he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. In the beginning of his ministry, Jesus started saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's making it aware that the kingdom of God is present. Now in the Bible, the fig tree often is an image of Israel. Hosea 9, Luke 13 and some Bible students interpret this parable to mean 
that the emergence of the state of Israel, which took place on May the 15th, 1948, was the sign that the Lord would soon return. And surely it's significant that Israel regained its state as a nation and that it's free after centuries of political bondage and ridicule. But Luke added, and all these trees. He didn't just say the one tree. I mean, if you look at the beginning of this passage and he told them a parable, look at the fig tree, which might represent Israel, and all the trees. So I think Luke added all the trees, suggesting that there was more than one nation involved in this end time plan. Perhaps that Jesus was saying that the rise of nationalism around the world is something to watch. I mean, in recent years, we've certainly seen the growth of nationalism and the emergence of new nations everywhere. And this may be a sign that the Lord is coming and that his coming is near. But nobody really knows. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But one thing we know for sure, that his return is imminent, that he can return at any moment. And that means for us that we should be alert, that we should be ready, that we should be living in a way that is honoring and glorifying to him. And so in the midst of this teaching, he says, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Critical here, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Listen, the basic idea here is that knowing is critical to what is going on. Understanding what's happening around you. Just like when a tree buds, you know that the summer is coming because it has a blossom. And these signs are indications that the Lord's return is soon. And he listed, I mean, if we go back to last week, there were tons of signs. But the important thing is that the believer knows, really knows, that God is keeping his word, that his word will never fail. Well, why is that important? Because we stand on his promises. His promises never fail. They're our foundation. Understanding the promises of God gives us hope in the future. And when there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. If you don't have hope in the future, what kind of power do you have in the present? We need hope in the future so that we can have power for today. And so we stand on the promises of God. We don't stand on our own thoughts or our own intentions or our own inclinations or our own abilities. We can't because they won't last. But his promises, they last forever. Do you remember what Joshua said at the end of his life? Joshua, after leading Israel, comes to the end of his life and he says in Joshua chapter 23 verse 14 he says and now I am going I am about to go the way of all the earth what does that mean and I'm about to go the way of all the earth that means I'm going to die all right I'm going the way that everybody goes this happens to everybody and now I am about to go the way of all the earth and you know in your hearts and souls all of you Everyone, this is the nation of Israel, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised. Not one word has failed. Because whatever God says is going to happen is going to happen. We have to bank, we have to stand, we have to live on his promises. His promises are critical. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Listen, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will last forever. So let me ask you, how are you doing on the word? Like, are you really tucking away his promises? If we were to go around the room right now and say, let's, let's just throw out some promises, like greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world, 1 John 4, 4, right? Or Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, right? Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, who've been called according to his purpose. You know, 
Neither height nor depth nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We have to stand on his promises. Isaiah 26, 3, right? He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast on me. I mean, we need to know his promises. We need to be tucking these in our heart, and we need to be meditating on them and living on them because his promises are a source of power for us. Now, often when you read this passage, people get away from the whole, his word will never fail, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, and they get so concerned on the, what he said right before that, the clause that this generation will not pass, and it causes controversy and trouble for people. The clause, this generation, the word generation comes from the Greek word genia, and it can mean race, or it can mean nationality, or it can mean generation. It certainly will not pass until all these things have happened. So this causes controversy. People read that, and they say, well, did it already happen? Some who doubt that Jesus will literally return say that this statement applies to the generation of the apostles, so that the coming of the Lord has already taken place. They believe that it happened either through the spirit of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit descended, or they believe that it took place in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Some think that Jesus was telling his disciples that their generation would, you know, not pass until they see the destruction of the temple, which is easy to see how that would fit in this interpretation, because when you go back to verses 5 and 7, he was talking about this temple, not one stone will be left upon another. So you can see that some people think that that pertain to the temple's destruction. But when you look at it in context and you look at verse 31 and on, Jesus spoke of the coming of the kingdom, which is critical to understand the context. And when, you ever, when you're interpreting passages, you have to interpret them in parallel consequences. When Jesus was talking about this in Matthew and when Jesus was talking about this in Mark and what he was saying in Luke and you put them together. So when you look at Matthew 24, 34, it seems preferable to say that these words are talking about the generation that will be living at the time of these cosmological events that he talked about in verse 24. In verse 24, he talked about the sun, the moon, the stars, the ragings of the waves in the ocean and the sea. The generation that experiences that will see the founding of the kingdom of God. Now, every generation of Jewish citizens had always lived and longed throughout their history to see that day. That's all they wanted. They wanted to see the coming of their Messiah. There are Jews today in Israel still longing for the coming of the Messiah. But nobody knows. Nobody knows when he's going to come. All we know is that his return is imminent. All we know is that Jesus is coming back. Why? How can we believe that? Because he promised. His word is true. You have to stand on his promises. You have to believe that what he said is true. When Jesus said, I will never leave you and never forsake, that's a promise. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And what a promise. It doesn't mean that we won't go through hard times, but in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our conflict, he is right there. He is walking with us through the fires of life, through the trials of life. He is always with us. His promises give us hope. And so what we should do as believers is take responsibility. And I believe that Jesus lays out for us our responsibility as Christ followers. In the next verses, he says, this is how we respond. This is how we live based on what he has promised. And his promise is that he will return. So in verse 34, Jesus says, but watch yourself. It doesn't mean walk around looking like, you know, I'm going to watch myself. <laughs> you know, it's not like just watch yourself. He's talking about your attitudes and your actions. Jesus says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And the days come upon you suddenly like a trap. Now the days that he's talking about is the days of tribulation or the end times or judgment. All right, He's dealing with end time stuff. And he says that we need to watch ourselves because these days will come 
upon us. His first admonition was no. You know, know what the seasons are. See them. No. His second admonition is watch. We should know and we should watch. Both admonitions apply to God's promise in every age for every believer. Now, they have special meaning for those Jews that will go through the tribulation. But we all need to watch. And we all need to be awake and alert and ready. Watching doesn't mean that you just stand around looking for signs. And there are so many in this generation that want a sign, just like the Jews did. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. We go to these services that are charismatic and flared with signs and healings and miracles. Everybody looking for a sign. Listen, God has given us all the signs we need. When his son hung on the cross, stretched out his arms and said, it is finished. What other sign do you need? Do you need another sign that God really loves you? More than the fact that his son stretched out his arms and died for you? How much more do we need? We're always like, God, show me. God, show me you love me. He already did. Jesus laid down his life. He was innocent. He became our atonement. He was our propitiation. The sacrificial atonement that we needed for all of our sins. That we might be forgiven and redeemed and reconciled back to the Father. That's why I gave you the memory verse. Be sober-minded. Know what time it is. Keep your head on straight. Be watchful. Be aware of what's going on around you, what you're getting sucked into, and what your thought life, where your thought life is taking you. Because what you believe determines what you think. Your thoughts are based on beliefs, whether you know that or not. It's true that when you believe something, it creates your patterns of thought. Your beliefs determine what you think. And what you think determines what you feel. And what you feel determines what you do. Your behavior is a byproduct of what you're feeling. And your feelings are a byproduct of what you think. And your thinking is a byproduct of what you truly believe. Now you can say, I believe this. And I believe that. But if your thoughts take you somewhere else, then it's not what you truly believe. Like we say we believe that God is sovereign. We say that we believe that God will meet our needs, but then we worry. So we really don't believe that God will meet all of our needs. We say that with our lips, but we don't believe that because worrying says something else. It says that I'm worrying because I don't trust God. See, that's an underlying belief. So when you worry, you have to ask yourself, what am I believing that's causing me to worry? Well, obviously, you're believing that God won't meet your needs, that you're on your own, that you have to take care of yourself, that it's up to you to make it happen. So when you worry, you got to tell yourself, I'm believing a lie. I'm not walking in the truth. Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Lies won't set you free. And Satan is the father of lies, right? John 8, 44. He's been a liar since the beginning. He's the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to sow these lies into your mind and into your heart so you believe the lies. So instead of taking your thoughts captive, right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, ready to punish each act of disobedience. If you don't take your thoughts captive and say, wait a minute, this isn't the truth. God's word says. And then God's word becomes the supreme thing in which you stand on, in which you live by. Because it's so easy for us to fall into all these lies. They've been sowed into our lives our whole life. From the time you're that big, man, your mom tells you, you can do anything you want. You can be anything you want to be. That's a lie. You can't be anything you want to be. I wanted to be a basketball player, but I'm only five foot nine now. I couldn't be a basketball Well, you say, yeah, but look at Spud Webb. He's five foot seven. That's right. I still can't jump and touch the net, much less the rim. I'm not slam dunking a basketball, right? I can't be anything I want. I couldn't be an astronaut. 
I'm not smart enough to be an astronaut. The only job I could find was to preach, right? Because, look, we get, we get trapped by what we believe without realizing we believe it. It's subtle, man. Satan is subtle. And he sows these lies into our lives and into our thoughts, and then we don't even realize that we're not believing the truth. We think that what we're believing is right. We tell ourselves, well, this is right. This is the way it should be. But you got to measure it according to the word of God. Everything. Jesus is warning his disciples to be ready at all times. To be ready. Though a believer in the end times will be able to anticipate the coming of the kingdom by the signs... It's possible, and that's what he's saying, to get so entangled with the affairs of this life that some will not be ready for the kingdom. I mean, Jesus said, be watchful, right? Watch yourself. And then he lays out three things. Let your hearts be weighed down. Be weighed down with what? Dissipation. What's that? Debauchery. It's carnal living. Your heart will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness. What is drunkenness, right? It's intoxication. It's getting high. It's escapism. It's a way of not dealing with reality or looking at what's really in front of you. So he says dissipation. He says drunkenness. And then he lays one out that hits us all. And the cares of this life are bills, our family, our jobs, our relationships, the cares of this life, they can consume us. You can get so caught up in what's going on around you that you forget why you're here, that we forget who we are. And it's critical for us to understand that Jesus wants us to keep our focus on him, to really focus on him so that we don't we don't fall so that we're not living down here when we should be living up here and he's given us everything we need everything to live a godly life second peter 1 3 right his divine nature has given us everything we need for life and godliness for both for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us according to his goodness so he's given us what we need and we have to walk in it. We have to learn to walk in the truth. We need to be brainwashed. Yeah, I said that out loud. We need to be brainwashed. Our minds need to be washed with the word of God. We've got to renew our minds daily. I mean, isn't that what Paul said in Romans 12? He said, I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And then in verse 2, he says, and be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. We've got to wash away the dirt and the grime in our heads. And we have to renew our minds with the word of God. Because the day of the Lord is coming. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times. Now can you literally stay awake at all times? It's hyperbole, right? It's an exaggerated speech. Nobody can stay awake at all. You get delusions after three days. You start talking to yourself. You start seeing things. It's not what he means. He means to be watchful, to be alert. It's an exaggeration of speech so that we get the point. He really wants us to watch. So he exaggerates his speech here to make us understand. But stay awake at all times. Be alert. Be ready. Praying that you may have strength to escape all these things and that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man during difficult times. 
it is easy to give up. It is. It's easy just to throw in the towel when times are tough and to start living like the rest of the world, right? Just say, well, it's easier just to go this way. I have no conflict that way. I have no struggles that way. Let me just do what I want to do. And believers during the tribulation period, they'll face that temptation. But Jesus urges them, watch and pray, just like he urged the disciples the night he was betrayed. Watch and pray. Be alert, know what's going on, and be in his presence. Prayer is about being in his presence. It's about abiding in him and walking in him so that we can resist the temptations. Look, temptations are bound to come to every one of us in all different forms, in all different forms. Anybody here been tempted lately? Man, every time I get behind the wheel of my car, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to cuss at somebody. I'm tempted to cut somebody off. I'm tempted to chase somebody down. I'm tempted all the time. We are tempted all the time. But God doesn't want us to give in to our temptations. He wants us to stand strong. We know here that verse 36 refers primarily to believers standing before the Lord at the judgment. We know that. And when he returns to establish his kingdom, you can see that. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. God will separate the sheep and the goats. There will be a separation during that time. Because there were those in the tribulation that died through persecution. And we'll see the Lord. And there's those during that time that will, you know, give in. My question is, and hopefully none of us are here for that. But if you are, and if there is tribulation, where will you stand? Will you be ready? Will you watch and pray? Because look, if it's tough for them, it's even harder for us. You say, well, how is it harder for us? Man, it is so much harder for us, I believe, because we live in a a place of comfort and affluence. It's so easy for us to take life for granted. I mean, we have money. Everybody here has got food in their pantry. We got more than one pair of clothes. We got enough clothes to last for months, right? So we have clothes, we have food, we have money in the bank. You see, I think it's harder for us to really learn to depend on him, to trust in him, because we've got our retirements and we've got our jobs and our careers. And so I think for us, we're in more danger. Because life is so easy. And I know that a lot of people say, oh, life is so hard. (laughs) It's so hard. And we don't have a clue about what real hard is. Because we in our culture have never experienced hard. So you could say, well, it's relative, you know. It's relative because what I'm going through right now is difficult to me. Yeah, and I'm sure that it is. Whatever you're facing, because we're always either going into, in the middle of, or coming out of a crisis in our life, every one of us. So if you just came out of one, get ready, because you're going to go into another one, right? We're always going into, in the middle of, or coming out of a crisis, and that'll happen for the rest of our lives, because life is up and down. But the key for each of us is to learn how to stand, because I think if it was tough on these people, it's even harder on us. Because they're seeing all this. They're seeing the persecution. They're seeing all that is going on. And so for them, they know. I need to either stand or I need to turn. But for us, we can feel like we're doing the right thing by doing whatever we want to do. We can feel like we're doing what's right. Because in our own mind, in our mind, to ourselves, it makes sense. But that doesn't make it right. Just because it makes sense to you that it's right doesn't mean it's right. It's what does God say? See, that has to be the foundation of truth. What is God really saying about what we're choosing and what we're not choosing? About what we're doing and what we're not doing? About what we're giving and what we're not giving? When we're sharing our lives or not sharing our lives? In all things, what does God say? That needs to be the foundation for all truth. I love what Vance Havner said because 
He wasn't looking for signs. He said, I'm not looking for signs. I'm listening for a sound. You got to get your eyes off of all the signs and look for the sound of the trumpet and the shout of the archangel. And while you are living, your cry, your heart's beat should say, come, Lord Jesus that should be the beat of your heart. Revelation twenty two twenty. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That should be our cry. While we are here, our cry should be for Jesus, not more wealth, not a better relationship, not a better child. It's about our relationship to Jesus. Listen. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what he said. And all these things will be added unto you, right? Seek ye firstly. If you're seeking Jesus with all your heart, guess what? Your family will be okay. Your kids, they'll be okay. Your marriage, it'll be okay. If you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, meaning that you are seeking to be righteous in all things, doing what is right according to his will, according to his word, Everything else will fall in the right place. Even when it seems unfathomable, you're looking at your relationship thinking, I can't do this. You're looking at your conflict. You're looking at your career. You're looking at all this stuff, but you're looking at it with your eyes. You've got to see it with his eyes. You need an eternal perspective so that you can see it through his eyes. And you stand on his promises, knowing that no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what you are facing, he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And that one day, one day he's going to take us home. I mean, this is so short. But we get so caught up in the cares of this life that we forget why we're here. So let me ask you, why are we here? Why doesn't God just take us straight up after he saves us? I mean, right? I mean, he saves us. We're going to be with him for all eternity. Why doesn't? Because he's the one who does the work. He does the saving. So why doesn't he just take us straight up? Because he's got a job for us to do. For every one of us as believers, right? I mean, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? We're saved by faith through grace, not by works. Listen, no one should boast, right? So it's not about what we did. We know it's about what God did. But then you come to verse 10, and it says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God planned in advance. That God planned in advance for us to do. He has a job for you. He has a job for me. He has a task. And that task is to be a living testimony of his grace and his glory as we focus on him, as we keep our eyes on him, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through. That we are steadfast on him. Jesus wants us and every believer of all ages to be ready, to be aware, to be alert, to take responsibility for our own actions. Man, that drives me nuts. When we don't want to take responsibility for our own actions. As believers, we should be the first to take responsibility for whatever we do. Yep, I blew it. Yep, I said the wrong thing. Yep, I did the wrong thing. I handled this the wrong way. Man, I spent half my life telling my wife I'm sorry. Because I want to take responsibility. It doesn't matter whether she owns her part or not. Ever. Because I'm not worried about this relationship. I'm worried about this relationship. Because when this relationship is good and it's strong and it's right, then these relationships around me flourish. They grow. And they'll be whatever he wants them to be because I believe he's sovereign. I believe that he is sovereign in all things. So if I'll just seek him with all my heart and I'll just do what he wants me to do, and if I'll take responsibility for my own actions, for my own failings, I can trust him to work everything out everything out. I mean, that's his promise. So the last passage here in Luke is, and every day, so he, this is the end of his teaching. Every day, though, he was teaching in the temple. But at night, 
he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So during the day, he taught at night solitude, right? Listen, we all need solitude before service. If you're going to serve your community, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, you need solitude. Because if you have nothing to give, then your service is out of your own strength. We need to be alone with him so we can experience his power, so we can experience his grace, so that we have something to give to those around us. Solitude before service. If you look at Jesus' life, always going. Mark 135, while it was still dark outside, Jesus went to a solitary place, and he prayed. He got alone with the Father, and then he served the community. We all need that. Now, I'm going to challenge you in a little different way this week. Uh, I'm going to ask you to meditate on a passage of Scripture this week. And I'm going to, you know, just quickly exegete it, just quick, a little exposition of it. And I'm going to ask you every day, every day, to read over this passage, to read over this passage, to read over this passage, and to meditate on it, to meditate on it, to meditate on it, all week long, all right? It's First Peter. Since I gave you that verse as a memory verse last week, I'm going to ask you to meditate on this, to really to dig into it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, all right? And I'm going to quickly exegete it for you, but I'm going to ask you to really put this in your heart. And to every day, read it in the morning, read it at night. Read it in the morning, read it at night. And just meditate on it throughout the day. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. Humble yourself. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Humble yourself. That means to take action. Well, if you take action in trying to humble yourself, then what you do is end up building yourself up because you're focused on yourself. You see, true humility isn't beating yourself up superficially, like I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm not anything. That's false humility. True humility is forgetting about yourself, just forgetting about yourself altogether and focusing on all those around you, on him and them, on him and them. Humbling yourself is forgetting about yourself. It's not beating yourself up. It's not putting yourself down. It's just forgetting about you and what you're experiencing or what you're going through or what you're thinking, all right? Letting that go so that you're submitting yourself to God, and this is critical, to God's mighty hand. What you're saying is, I'm going to put myself under your authority. That's why it says under his mighty hand under the mighty hand of God. So you're saying, God, I'm going to forget about my needs. I'm going to forget about my wants. I'm going to forget about my complaints. And I'm going to put myself under your authority. I'm going to totally trust you to be the sovereign God of my life. Under the mighty hand of God. So that at the proper time, at the proper, when God sees fit at his time, in his way, he will exalt you. He will build you up. He will lift you up. He will take care of you. That's why it says casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So you take all those worries and all those struggles and all of this, and you just give them to him. You're like, Lord, right now I'm forgetting about me. I'm giving you everything. Here's all my problems. Here's all my struggles. Here's all my issues. Here's all my conflicts. Here's all my stuff, my relationships. And you're, you're giving it to him, and I'm submitting myself to the one who is sovereign over all things. I'm going to focus on those around me. I'm going to forget about me. And that's why verse 8 says, be sober-minded. Know where you're at. Know what this is about. Be watchful, all right? Because if you take up these cares, if you take up these worries, if you take up these anxieties, and you try to carry them yourself, Satan will strangle you. He will choke the life out of you. That's what the word anxiety means. It means to choke out. He will choke out the life that God wants to shine through. 
And that's what happens to us as believers. We get worried and entangled in this world, and Satan gets his claws in us, and he chokes the Christ out of us so that the world doesn't see Jesus. It sees us. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, knowing that you can rest in him. And then it says, resist him. This is where you take responsibility. Resist him. How do you do that? Firm in your faith, standing on his promises, standing on his word, believing what he says is true. Resist him, standing firm in your faith, knowing in the back of your mind and in your heart that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not in this alone. We all suffer at times. We all go through hardships. We all go through struggles. We all go through conflict. We all go through crisis. It's life. After you have suffered, not he's going to take you out of the suffering, not he's going to make it all go away, and after you have suffered a little while. Now, how long is a little while? Well, to you, it could be a moment. It could be a minute. It could be an hour. It could be a day. But it doesn't matter what it is to you. It matters what it is to him. It's not about our timing. It's about his timing. When he says a little while, it's just a little while. I mean, a day is, is a thousand years to the Lord, right? You could be suffering your whole life. And it could be a little while to God. So it's not for you to say, all right, God, I had enough. Because how many of us have done that? How many of us said, God, I can't take this anymore. God, this is too much. God, I'm done with this. We've all done that. God doesn't want that kind of response because that's not true humility because now you're focused on yourself. Listen to me. When you get depressed, it's self-pity. It's you thinking about yourself. Me, me, me. Depression starts in the mind. It's when you're thinking about how everything's bad in your life and how things don't go right for you and how you never get a break and me, 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 I, 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 which is really pride. That's all it is. Self-pity is pride. And pride is destructive and will destroy you. It will always keep you from being who God wants you to be. After you have suffered a little while, I love this, the God of all grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor, right? It's what God gives us that we do not, could never deserve or earn. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. What's he going to do? He's going to restore you. He's going to confirm you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to establish you in your faith when you trust him. Why? Because he's the God of all grace. Because he's the one who called you. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that has done the work in your life. Trust him. Lay it down at his feet. Rely on him. Stop taking everything into your own hands. Stop trying to fix everything. Stop worrying about everything. Just take responsibility and do what he wants you to do. Be responsible and trust him. So that is what I want you to meditate on this week. And then I'm giving you a memory verse to go along with this. I know I'm stretching you this week. And I'm pushing. Because I'm going to give you, man, uh, a memory verse that is not like your normal memory verse. It's verses 13 through 16 in First Peter. And I'm tying these together for a reason. Just trust me. First Peter chapter 1, memory verse. Verse 13, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, set your mind fully on the grace that will be brought to you through Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. When you lived 
Without Christ, you were ignorant of your relationship to Christ or who he was or what he did for you. Don't be ignorant anymore. And what does ignorant mean? It's not a bad word. We look at ignorant like somebody says, hey, you're ignorant. Yeah, I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant about a lot of things in this life. I don't know how uh, a lot of things work, to be honest. I don't know anything about internal combustion. All I know is my car starts. All right? I don't know how it happens. I'm just glad I can stick the key in and turn it on. So I'm ignorant about internal combustion. I'm ignorant about a spaceship that flies to the moon. I don't know exactly how that works, but I'm glad they can go there. All right? I don't know how an airplane that weighs so much can fly through the air. I don't get it. I'm not a physicist. I'm not into physics or something. I don't get it. But anyway, ignorance is not a bad word. Ignorant means you're unlearned. Hear me. Ignorant means that you are uneducated or unlearned in that area. So what is Jesus really saying? What is the word saying to us? As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. When you were unlearned, uneducated, when you didn't know about Jesus. Don't go back to that way. Because now you know. Now you know the truth. You know the truth will set you free. You know that. Don't go back to the former way of ignorance. But as he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So I'm going to ask you to memorize 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Yeah, I know it's a big chunk. So every day you need to be reading over this and meditating on it. While you're reading over 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, over and over, just meditating on these two together. I right? just put them together like sandwich, right? And all the good stuff will be in the middle. All right? Just gonna put these together and meditate on them. I'm telling you, God will work in your life and in your heart when you put his word in your life. Will you pray with me? Lord, I am so unworthy to share your word. I'm unworthy to know your truth. I'm definitely unworthy, Father, to be a witness for you. But your grace is sufficient. And you are the God of all grace who saved us. You saved me. God who's changing me every day. Helping me, Lord, to look more like Jesus, to act more like Jesus, to believe more like Jesus, to trust more like Jesus, to think more like Jesus. God, and that's the hope of our hearts, that you will make us more like Jesus, that we would look more like Jesus, God, that we would behave more like Jesus, that the world God, this lost and dying world would see Jesus in us. Lord, let the light shine from our hearts, from our conversations, from our attitudes, God, from the way we love each other. And let your light shine in our lives that the world might see Jesus. I love you. I'm grateful that you loved me. And I know that I only love you because you first loved me. And so, God, I just pray that you would use your word to speak to our hearts and our minds. That we would truly learn to trust you in all things. God, that we would lay aside the lies that we have believed. And that we would start walking in the truth. For your glory, God, and for your honor, in Jesus' name, amen.